So I want to welcome everyone. I'm Bill Doley, the president and CEO of Archaeology Southwest. We're in our 16th season of Archaeology Cafes. And uh, surprisingly, we're also six, this is our sixth one of this uh, particular season. So that's been going uh, very rapidly and um, especially good uh, presentations all through the season. And you'll be getting some more of that tonight. So uh, Linda Pierce and I are here in Tucson at our Archaeology Southwest uh, uh, main office, and this is the homeland of the Ton Autumn and the Pascoyaki tribes. And wherever you are tonight, because uh, we've got people literally uh, sometimes all around the world that join these uh, presentations, uh, take time to acknowledge the uh, indigenous people whose lands you are on tonight. We've, we've focused all through this year on the uh, uh, human relationships, collaboration. Um, archaeologists work with an archaeological record and try to you know, derive information about past relationships and, and that sort of thing. Um, but what we're particularly interested on this year is the way in which the relationship between archaeologists and community members um, is a collaborative process and that that brings so much more to uh, both the present and the past and the future in terms of the way archaeology can, can work and really have value. Something that we try to um, invest in and, and work with here at Archaeology Southwest. And speaking of uh, collaborators, I want to acknowledge the Smith Living Trust who provide support that make this uh, possible. And so Jean and Eldon Smith and Jay Smith, thank you so much for your support. And tonight's two speakers, uh, you're gonna enjoy uh, immensely, I can predict, um, Stuart Koyomtewa and Wes Bernardini. Uh, Stuart is the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer at Hopi and Wes is a professor at Redlands University, University of Redlands. So I'm gonna let them take over the show here. And uh, they've got a presentation tonight called Collaborative Archaeology and the Becoming Hopi Project. Wes and Stuart, thank you so much. It's all yours. All right, thank you, Bill. I'm gonna share my screen. All right, so I thought we'd start by uh, introducing ourselves. Um, in a little more depth. So I'll let Stuart um, take the first introduction. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Stuart Bruce Koyayamtiwa. I am the um, Cultural Preservation Office Program Manager and uh, Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Hopi Tribe. I come from the village of Hopevela, located on Third Mesa um, on Hopi. And um, I currently reside with my family in, in the Flagstaff and um, commute back and forth uh, to the Hopi tribe. Um, in, in Hopi, um, when you marry, um, in, in, our, in our way, you go and, and leave with the, the female, your, your wife's home. So we make our home here. And I've been going back and forth, if you can believe it or not, I, uh, from Flagstaff to Hopi for approximately 24, 25 years now. So um, I thank you for being here and I'll, I'll let Wes introduce him, himself. All right, thanks Stuart. So my name is Wes Bernardini. Um, as Bill said, I'm a professor of anthropology at the University of Redlands where I've been for about 20 years now. I got my PhD from Arizona State University back in 2003. And pretty much ever since then, I've been working with the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office, first with Lee Kwan Wasilama when he was the director and now with Stuart. So I have a um, longstanding relationship with the Preservation Office and with the Hopi tribe. And um, it's that long relationship that forms the basis of the collaboration that we're gonna talk to you about today. So just um, as, a, as an initial overview, uh, this Becoming Hopi Project references the 2021 book that was published 
by the University of Arizona Press. And in this book, uh, Stuart and I and, and a number of other uh, contributing authors tried to pull together as much of the work that's been done, that's been facilitated by the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office on Hopi history um, into one volume. And a volume that ideally is accessible to a number of different audiences, um, not just academic, but especially importantly, a tribal audience. Uh, and so today we're gonna talk about how this collaborative project came to be. And I think, you know, an important disclaimer is that all collaborative projects, I think, are unique. They, if they're going to work, they need to be tailored to the particular interests of the collaborating parties, and especially the particular interests of, of the tribal group, the indigenous group. Um, but I think that we have learned some lessons that are probably broadly useful that could be applied in other uh, contexts. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about the process that produced this book, and we'll end with some suggestions of how archeology span perhaps could still change further in the future to make collaborative work more productive for everyone who's involved. And then before I turn it back to Stuart, I just wanna quickly acknowledge that Stuart and I are just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the contributors to this book. Um, so there are two other co-editors, uh, Greg Schachner, archeologist at UCLA, and Lee Kuan Wasuama, the retired Hopi Culture Preservation Office director. There are also five Hopi authors um, who contributed um, chapters to the book, uh, Stuart's daughter, Moana Lamayamvaya, uh, Joel Nicholas, who's an archaeologist with the Hopi Culture Preservation Office, Lee Wayne Lomayestawa, who's also in the Preservation Office, Lyle Balanqua, who's an independent um, cultural resources consultant, and Trent Tutsi, who's an artist. Uh, and in addition, um, the voices in the book include 23 different Hopi consultants who were interviewed, um, and there are uh, nine additional non-tribal um, authors who contributed content to the book. So we wanna recognize all of their important work. Okay, I'll turn it back to you, Stuart. Yeah, thank you, um, Wes, for that um, brief history on how the, the, the book came about. Um, um, as I said, I, I come from Hotvela um, and I grew up there and um, I didn't know um, during my youth growing up and seeing the activities within the village. And um, so I didn't really know at that time that what I was seeing there was um, in a way collaborative work. And when I see collaborative, um, when I say collaborative work, I'm, I'm talking about the functions that go on in the village. So for instance, um, say a wedding, a Hopi wedding. Um, typically you cannot do a Hopi wedding without having some sort of collaboration from both parties of the bride and groom. Um, and then your extended family, which includes your uh, godparents when you receive at birth uh, on both sides, um, different relatives, and they all contribute to uh, the successful operation of a Hopi wedding, which um, usually, you know, back in, um, in the late uh, times of Hopi usually takes a month. Now, you know, it's becoming uh, quick, um, but all of that collaboration and, and the successful portion of someone contributing to the overall um, uh, process is, is what I was seeing. So in archeology, span um, it, it, I think it started out, you know, where um, uh, scholars were simply um, looking for and, and trying to prove their, their theories of what they were seeing out in the landscape 
not just in the Southwest, but all over the world. Um, and archaeology uh, is a science where in the beginning, it didn't re require uh, collaboration with um, descendant communities of the, the areas that they were studying. So, um, so when I, I first kind of uh, understand what archaeology was doing, I was kind of taken aback because, you know, they didn't need to require or require to um, get in touch with descendant communities and get their perspectives on what they were studying. So um, I know uh, through my work at the Hopi tribe, I'm trying to slowly try to change that perspective, change the narrative, mm -hmm. and have a voice in um, tribal voice in a lot of projects that go on. Um, and collaboration, you know, um, is slowly changing with uh, how anthropologists and, and even archaeologists are now viewing uh, their scopes of work. Um, and um, so even in, in, in my time at uh, the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office, uh, I, I've worked alongside archaeologists and anthropologists and, and seeing their methods and um, asking questions. Um, and it wasn't until um, this book, uh, a, a publication from the Cultural Preservation Office that um, was published that I kind of got a, another perspective of what collaboration means. Um, and this book I'm talking about is um, called uh, Footprints of Hopi History, the publication before becoming Hopi. And, you know, I, I was somewhat, um, I guess, proud to be a part of this, what at the time, um, this magnificent publication. And, um, we had asked the, the contributing or the audit, uh, editors of that book to see if they could get copies of that book so that um, uh, our Hopi advisors to the office, um, they're called Cultural Resources Advisory Task Team, CRAT for short. And, um, you know, I, I, I was, you know, delighted and happy and to, to provide these books on behalf of the um, editors of that book. And I handed each one of our members at the time of uh, the new publication um, to read the book. And um, it may have been um, two months after uh, at another uh, CRAT meeting, um, I asked them uh, what they thought about the, the different chapters. And, and that book is really about the formation of the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office and highlighting the, the re, uh, works of the Cultural Preservation Office and uh, learning aspects of anthropology and archaeology. Um, so I asked that question, what did you think of that book? And um, it was kind of silent for a while. And Riley Balenga, who is uh, Lyle's um, um, father, he got the courage to speak his mind. And he told uh, me directly, yeah, this is yeah, a, a, a good scholarly work. I, um, I don't doubt any of the work in there and it highlights the the accomplishments of our work. But he then said, he goes, but this book isn't written for us. It's too academic. It's too technical to read. And I, I, I was lost um, in the different chapters using um, terms from archeology span and the, the sciences and um, so, you know, I was taken aback by that, 
comment and then others soon follow. Yeah, this is really hard to read. Um, and I've even had other academic um, people say say the same same thing. So um, uh, so when when we really started working I, uh, on, on becoming Hopi, I um, started thinking, how do I approach this request? And um, so uh, in, in, in terms of what collaboration means from a Hopi perspective, I, I think it's something that everyone works together and, and not be uh, left out in the dark, and and it's 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 a process from uh, start to the end. Um, and you don't in Hopi, you don't invite someone to join midway or in the end. Uh, collaboration in Hopi means that you ask someone to do them, you work with them side by side, you come to an understanding of where the final um, process is leading to, uh, and then you settle maybe disagreements so that um, there's no harsh feelings as, as the accomplishment um, and work is continuing to its final end. So um, that's how I, I view collaboration. It, it, it's, it's quite different from uh, the science perspective, um, uh, and, and, and I'm slowly trying to make my voice heard in how archaeology is uh, currently done. So I just want to follow on that by um, talking about how collaboration, how I've experienced collaboration um, from the perspective of a non-tribal archaeologist um, and how, how we tried to meet uh, Riley's standard of um, writing a book that was, was for everyone. So, you know, the short, short answer to how I've experienced collaboration is that there's constant consultation. So I consult with Stuart and the rest of the Cultural Preservation Office staff and the CRAT team before during and after field work. You know, there's especially a lot of conversations that happen before. And the, the most powerful conversation that I had in a CRAP meeting happened uh, way back when I was um, initially sort of planning my dissertation research. My very first CRAP meeting, uh, when I, I came up and talked about my interest on in working on some sites in, in central Arizona, that I knew were um, had connections to Hopi, were ancestral Hopi sites. And uh, so I gave a, a very brief presentation, just sort of saying, would this be okay? I didn't, I didn't have a particular research agenda uh, in mind other than to, to sort of work on these sites. Um, but even so, I, after I, I finished my presentation, again, there was sort of this period of silence where the CRAP members digested what I'd said and then um, one particular CRAP member, Dalton Taylor, uh, who was one of the original CRAP members, asked me a sort of point blank. He said, that's all fine and good. You know, I understand you want to do your dissertation on this, but what do we get out of it? What do we as Hopi people get out of it? And I was embarrassed to discover that that was really the first time I'd, I'd thought of it in that way. That I, that I hadn't framed a benefit to, to the tribe, to Hopi people. Um, and so that became my standard for future collaborative work is if I was going to propose any research, I had to have thought about an answer to that question ahead of time and to be prepared to be flexible about that if, if the response was, well, okay, that's, that's okay, but we want something, um, that's different. So, uh, so lots of consultation um, and lots of conversations. Another way that collaboration has changed my archaeological practice is that it doesn't look like the kind of 
archaeological projects that we thought we were going to do when we were graduate students. You know, the model that was presented to us then was you get a big NSF grant and you go in for a big chunk of field work, you generate as much data as you can, and then you come back out of the field and, and you write it up. But that isn't really conducive to collaboration, um, in part because an NSF grant is not really written in the language um, that's accessible to a wide audience. And it's also this sort of one-off project where you drop in, do an intensive amount of work, and then you just leave again. And again, that's, that's not a really a way of establishing a relationship with a descendant community. So the kind of field work that I found myself doing is very different from that NSF model, where we try to go out to Hopi at least a couple times every year for relatively short visits. And the agenda for those visits is almost never determined ahead of time. We'll sometimes have a few conversations in the weeks leading up to our field work, but for the most part, we come in and the first meet morning, we sit down with Stuart and Joel and Lee Wayne, and we talk about what needs to be done. Are there sites that have been recently eroded or sites that have been recently vandalized or some chance discovery? Um, somebody was out you know, checking fences and saw something eroding out of the road. Uh, so you have to be flexible and record whatever makes sense for the cultural preservation office, for, for a village, for the tribe in general. Um, and so that makes it hard to have a, a scripted research agenda. But if you are committed to a long-term relationship with a descendant community, that means over time you'll accumulate lots and lots of data that are relevant to lots and lots of different questions. So if you're in it for the long term, you'll, you'll get more information than you could ever hope to work with, uh, but it's a very different model than what archaeologists are often taught um, in graduate school. So what does is, what is field work look like, this collaborative field work? So again, it's very small field groups. There's often just four or five of us, a couple archaeologists from outside the tribe, and then two or three people from the cultural preservation office out in the field. So maybe four or five of us total. Um, you know, the one of the strong mandates of the cultural preservation office is that we don't disturb deposits below the ground. So we only record surface deposits. Um, but of course, there's a tremendous amount of information sitting there on the surface of a site. Um, and so we use GPS and drones and photography to document wall alignments and other features. We make small surface collections of pottery. Uh, and again, it's a very rich data set. Um, it's more extensive than intensive, but in the course of the 20 years that we've been coming up to the Hopi Reservation, we've recorded hundreds and hundreds of, of new sites um, that uh, had previously never been, never been recorded. So um, a, a very productive, um, but non-invasive type of research. All right, I'll turn it back to you now, Stuart. So in the Hopi tribe, um, we, we, through the Hopi tribe, we have um, what we call a research uh, protocol where researchers will submit um, their, their project proposals to the Hopi tribe and it comes through the cultural preservation office. And so there's different levels of, of research requests and uh, those that require um, uh, archaeology or extensive, um, uh, I guess, diving into Hopi culture usually goes um, before the, the, the cultural advisory task team um, for, for review. And um, we, we have them go through that because um, being Hopi um, is, is really um, uh, difficult um, in, in terms of we don't all, always hold the same information and that could be because we um, uh, gain information in, in a variety of uh, formats. Um, 
and through societies uh, and, and even through villages. So um, it also makes it um, a, a hard system because there's 12 in, in independent villages at Hopi um, with their own way of thinking, their own knowledge systems into different areas such as clan histories, uh, migration histories, um, dif different perspectives on how um, uh, ceremony and religion came into that particular village. So um, it, it's not simple, like if you were to approach some other public tribe like Zuni or Akuma, where they're one unified group at Hopi, uh, the tribe has to uh, consult with 12 independent villages. So, uh, and, and, and gain that approval if the research is going to move forward. And one of the first questions on our protocols is that what is the benefit to the Hopi tribe or the Hopi people? How is your research going to benefit the Hopi people? So, um, you know, some some students will and researchers will make the attempt to, you know, and, and sometimes it's it's the it's some question that they probably never even were are asked. So they have to kind of um, retract their their proposals and resubmit. And those that you know are are um, good collaborators will take the initiative and and um, present also to the CRAT. And I've heard numerous um, researchers and students um, tell me afterward from in, in presenting to the, the advisory group that that was one of the most difficult uh, things that they had to do, you know, is present to a group of uh, elders from the villages and, and lay their plans out, lay their um, uh, studies out and, and Finally, you know, convincing a, a, a group versed in history of Hopi and their clanship systems and village history to approve their project. Um, and, and I think, you know, once they get approval, um, you know, they're, they're comfortable in, in collaboration with, um, with, with, with the tribe, but it, it becomes, um, uh, taskful too because uh, we require um, people who research Hopi to continue to come back and update them. And um, I know there's several um, researchers who, you know, have not gone there. And that, that kind of places a negative impact on their character because, you know, they've gone through the process, they've researched and uh, they they finish their their projects, but you know they never come back, and I think that's one of the the issues that I'm I'm currently faced with. So um, with with this publication, uh, I know um, uh, there was this process that um, uh, Greg and and Wes had um, kind of drafted. Um, chapters already to present to CRAT. And we had a, um, a, a mini conference at Museum of Northern Arizona in 2008. And we invited um, uh, researchers who have worked um, in the past with the Hopi tribe to see if they wanted to be contributing editors. Um, so, you know, at that meeting, I, I stood up and um, I know the former director was there and I think he, he was surprised that I stood up because he is the, also the uh, editor of the Becoming Hopi, um, I mean, Becoming um, uh, Footprints of Hopi History uh, book that I mentioned earlier. And I, I told the, the group there at the MNA of what Riley said that the, book that he was an editor of was too technical, academic, and not made for, for the Hopi tribe or for the um, general Hopi person out at Hopi to learn about their history. 
And at that time, he had just recently retired. Um, so in 2008, I was now the, the acting program manager for the Cultural Preservation Office. And I told the group there, and I told Wes and Greg, um, if I'm to approve this research, I want it to be written for Hopi. I want it to be um, something that a, a, a layman, Hopi person would pick up and learn something about the their own history. And I think you know, you know, I didn't mean to uh, have Wes and Greg and others um, redo their work, but. In a sense, they did have to rewrite their chapters um, to show me, who was now the head of the uh, Cultural Preservation Office, that that they needed to refocus and, and work to benefit Hopi, no one else. Um, and um, through this uh, publication of Becoming Hopi, I've had um, people say Asquali um, from him, uh, female perspective, um, meaning thank you, from a male perspective, Kwakwa, for not only having this published so that future generation, current Hopi people can learn about themselves, but it was indeed something that um, they could pick up and understand and read and, and learn about themselves. So, um, and when we have these projects, you know, it, it it's kind of um, that responsibility and burden of the review is, is, is there because we're, we're reviewing for 12 independent villages, um, 30 plus clans that are currently existing. Um, we're reviewing for, for, societies, religious societies, we're reviewing for um, sensitivity to, to not um, provide too much information that is, is going to damage Hopi. So all of that, you know, is under our, our, our minds and, and when we're accepting publications of this and, and, um, and once it's finished, you know, it's always a sigh of relief and and hope and we pray that um, it, it's, a, it's a work that it's going to benefit all Hopi people. Thank you. And I just wanna sort of reemphasize what Stuart was talking about. You know, so in this 2018 um, conference at the Museum of Northern Arizona, uh, we had been working on this book at that point for a couple of years already. Uh, we'd assembled teams of um, scholars that included uh, tribal scholars and non-tribal scholars. They'd been putting their heads together to come up with these drafts. Uh, and we, with the explicit agenda of writing for a broad audience. And still at that point, we realized that we, we weren't meeting that standard. And that was when we had to tear it down and, and write it again. Um, and at that point, I had been collaborating with the Hopi Culture Preservation Office for 15 years. So it's, this is a difficult standard to meet. Um, it's a really different way of framing research. It's a really different way of writing it, of presenting it. Um, so it's not something that's, that's a, a sort of easy gear to switch into. It really is a transformation of the research process but it's really productive, um, really powerful. So I just wanna talk briefly about, I think, what some of the benefits of this collaborative work are. Um, you know, I think the real power is that you can bring these different perspectives together and, uh, you know, sort of a, maybe a traditional scientific material-based approach to reconstructing what happened in the past um, and an oral tradition 
based perspective on what happened in the past and not take a um, an approach where you have to compare them against each other and sort of figure out which one's right in each, each sort of particular historical circumstance, but blend them and play them off of each other and um, use both, um, you know, take their strengths and put them together. You know, so I think it's, it's telling that the Becoming Hopi book has these two radically different maps in, in, the, in the same book, and they both speak to a, a variety of audiences. The map on the left um, being a, a synthetic map of, tries to sort of blend many, many different clan migration traditions together um, to sort of show the, both the scale of Hopi migration traditions, um, the, the area that, that clans traveled in the past, and also the complexity of it. Um, the sort of looping, um, spiraling, revisiting of places um, that that speaks to the the time depth and um, a nonlinear process by which clans converged on the Hopi mesas. And then the the slide on uh, the figure on the right is a um, more maybe a more traditional archaeological map that shows the distribution of different pottery types. And I think when you put those maps together, they start to, to, to sort of have a dialogue with each other where you can start to see, oh, well, some other traditions are correlating with certain areas that Hopi clans have uh, originated in or moved through. And of course, there, you know, you have to have lots of different slices of time to see how that changes. Um, but I think those two maps only really work together in a truly collaborative work, and they work really well when you Put them against each other when, when they're talking to each other. And then the other big benefit of this kind of collaborative work is that it's actually a model for a sustainable archaeology. I don't think the kind of archaeology that I was taught to practice in graduate school is actually workable in today's political landscape. Um, you just can't do that if you want to work on indigenous history. You have to work with descendant communities um, uh, in this in this um, regular, repeatable way. You, again, as Stuart said, you can't just show up and then never come back again. You won't be allowed back again. So this is this is actually the way archaeology, I think, needs to function going forward. And um, I'm going to turn it back to Stuart now and let him talk about what he sees as the future of archaeological practice, maybe how that still needs to, to change. And then he's going to talk about how, um, how Hopi people are increasingly a part of that future vision. <clears throat> you know, through, throughout my 20 plus years at the Cultural Preservation Office, I've had the opportunity to listen and even work alongside uh, cultural resource um, firms, uh, cultural resource management firms. And, um, you know, by the time projects reach Hopi and that offer a participation, a lot has happened already. Um, usually uh, surveys are completed, the survey reports are completed, um, and the last check mark of the process is to um, consult with tribes uh, and descendant communities um, regarding their findings. And to me, that's really not collaborative work. Um, it's um, a process where it's, uh, uh, I see it as a superiority over uh, a group of people. And I also view it as that they, mo uh, archaeologists, anthropologists, and scientists know more about who we are as our own, as, as, as us, as Native people and, and descendant communities. And I really don't, um, I, I, I can't work with somebody who is, is, has that mindset. Um, so in my view, um, moving forward, I think, um, the future of Southwest archaeology should be uh, that invitation to participate. 
from cultural resources firms, from universities, from um, um, whoever is holding this project, and even uh, to make it even uh, successful is to offer the tribe to do the work on its own. You know, in, in today's day, you know, we have um, qualified Hopi archaeologists, we have qualified anthropologists who are Hopi, ethnographers, researchers, um, people who are knowledgeable and have the same uh, degrees and have gone through the same process to uh, be in the positions they, that they are, you know. Um, Moana, my daughter, is one example. Lyle Balinkla is uh, my staff. Joel, you know, they've all received that training. You know, offer it to, to the Hopi tribe to do the work on its own. Um, and language has a big part in, in archaeology uh, uh, because uh, language is the, 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 the highest, um, I guess, uh, skill that you, a Hopi person can have. And when we work alongside uh, non-Hopi non people, we have to talk in English, whereas where we can do the work on our own, we have the ability to talk Hopi among ourselves. And it's a lot easier to understand Hopi coming from advisors and obtaining the knowledge of um, the, the landscape or um, an ancestral home, a footprint. It, it's a lot easier to, to bring it into yourself as a Hopi person than, how you, than having the, the advisor um, speak in a secondary language, English, to try to describe what is out there. Um, but, you know, if, if, you know, collaboration is to, to happen at Hopi, um, you need to come at the very beginning. And it's sad to say that a lot of um, planning, the engineering, the planning, you spent millions of dollars on there. Um, you get your plan set and, and, you, you, like I said, your, your archeological survey reports, cultural resource reports are finished, and then they come to the tribe for, um, uh, you know, what do you think of this? You know, um, how do you want to mitigate this? Um, uh, we're, we're not going to be able to avoid um, this particular site. Um, and, and that's disheartening um, because you're essentially going to erase a footprint that has been there for hundreds, thousands of years off the landscape. And mitigation to archeologists, well, we're gonna do our darndest to record the site. We're gonna analyze that and provide that feedback to you. That doesn't do us any good. Um, and I proposed a long time ago of reverse archaeology. Instead of teaching up and coming archaeologists and, and um, even, you know, new archaeologists who are currently in the field to um, record and, and survey and then box up and, and take away to a, a facility for processing, just leave it there. Um, but their excuse is that, you know, it's going to, um, you know, it's if we leave it out here, somebody's going to come by and pick it up. And, and that's fine, too, um, because um, when you take something out of its context, um, it's, we feel, you, you see the, 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 the pottery shirts here, shards. Um, we Hopi people believe that it has a life. And when you take that piece away from it, 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 it carries its life somewhere. And we've, over the past years, have hundreds of items returned back to Hopi because, you know, something uh, negative happened to them. 
Um, so, you know, it's their own doing that they're, they, they made a conscious choice to take something that doesn't belong to them and take it away. So, you know, I don't know what it would take to um, educate the general public about those kind of experiences, but it sure does happen. Um, so, you know, as I said before, um, involve the tribes um, in the beginning. Um, and sometimes uh, the federal government is um, have, doesn't have the courage in, in their process to um, exclude a certain tribe when they know their history doesn't match the site. And, and they, they, they um, you know, affiliate everybody knowing that the evidence, the, the record um, does not support other tribes' history. And that's something else that, you know, I wish the federal just um, man up and say, oh, this tribe, you don't, uh, based on what we're seeing, you're, you're not affiliated. Um, there's been a recent, uh, there's a movement towards um, uh, uh, redrafting NAGPRA, but I've, I've hear, I'm hearing things that I'm from other people that it's not going to go anywhere because of those reasons. Um, but uh, the future of archaeology should always invite tribes, especially, you know, Hopi tribe to be at the table right from the beginning. And, and the future of Hopi archaeology at, at Hopi, you know, is, I think, in a positive move, move forward um, because uh, you, you see in, 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 in the pictures here, my own family members who are visiting sites. Um, my, little, my daughter, our daughter, Avalyn, um, at one point wanted to you know, go out and, and there's a site right where um, I, I have a field, cornfield. And she was so amazed at the, the, the uh, archaeology that was just there. And um, when you take uh, artifacts away from uh, its, its original place, um, you're, you're hindering the Hopi people like myself to have the opportunity to teach our children on the spot of, of their clan histories, of their migration, of who they are as Hopi people. Yeah, we get invitations to come to museum collection fields, uh, uh, collection areas and see the artifacts there, but it's, it's not the same when it's out in, in the field uh, to, to have the opportunity to look around the, uh, your surroundings uh, as far as the eye can see and teach about their own clan history. So, um, you know, I think archaeology, I hope it is bright. Um, I think we need to start more and in investing in, in educating our younger generation about their own history. And uh, fu the future of archaeology, I hope it also includes um, programs within Hopi to help uh, youth um, be a part of surveys, um, be a part of writing uh, reports and, and, and having them um, be a part of, of a publication like Becoming Hopi. You, tr you see Trent Duty on the fry, far right uh, at um, one of the Chaco Canyon sites. Um, and he, I, I, I bet you, you know, he's not going to forget, you know, participating in, in an activity and having a publication form, you know, come to life. And, you know, uh, and, and they're working on public speaking um, to, to ad advisors. And, you know, it builds their, their character. It, it, it makes them confident to, to present in, in, um, the outer, outer outside of Hopi at, at in, in in maybe in classes or even at conferences and like I said before you know researchers and and 
well-versed students in public speaking had a hard time um, communicating or presenting and maybe it's nerves to our, our advisors, but you know, that's where it starts. So, um, you know, we, we are op always open to ideas to collaborate, but I, I think um, uh, having as the Hopi tribe do the work on its own uh, is the first option and then uh, we'll work down the next steps. But um, I think this is the last slide we have and I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that you're here to at least learn a bit of how we work at Hopi, uh, at the Hopi tribe through the Cultural Preservation Office. Kwakwa. Um, well, thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Wes. This is Linda. Um, that was that was really very, very fascinating, very interesting. Really appreciate it. Um, if we have a little bit of time for some questions, maybe, can I ask a few questions of Wes and Stuart? Um, yeah, please. I don't know if you guys want to leave that slide up or if you want to just come back on screen or how you want to handle this. If we really don't care. You know, I'm pretty laid back. <laughs> um, Oh, I got a very, very specific down to earth practical question, Stuart. I'm going to ask you um, from um, from uh, uh, someone who works with um, botanical stuff. Um, he says he's working with a historical collection of corn at Missouri Botanical Garden in St. Louis. It includes Hopi corn collected by the USDA in 1913 and by Hugh Cutler in 1953. Who should he contact for guidance in working with this collection? Would it be you or what would you suggest? Yeah, it, it would be um, my office and- Your office? Uh, yeah. I thought I just, that would look like when I could answer. Um, I like to see he's saying, I want to work, let talk to you guys about it. And so we want to encourage that, so. <laughs> um, there have been a couple questions, and maybe this is for you, Wes, because you are in the academic world. Um, there have been a couple questions sort of asking about that. I don't want to say it's a conflict, but perhaps it's a perceived conflict between what we perceive a graduate student has to do in order to get a PhD and some of what you've been saying, you know, this evening, um, you know, NSF is sometimes the only way a graduate student can find money to do what they want to do, and yet it doesn't always meet the the needs of the collaborators. I'm wondering if you could talk any more about that because there's been a couple of questions about how this, how grad students could could um, apply some of this. Mm -hmm. I think it is a really a challenge to do this kind of collaborative work under the current graduate school model. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're, you're kind of under the time gun in graduate school and the, the nature of funding is still this sort of single large project. Um, yeah. So I, 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 I don't really have a good solution other than maybe to work with a more established archeologist who has created some of these collaborative relationships you know, it's maybe a little bit, you know, like the model where you're working in someone's lab, except you're not, you're not in the lab, you're in their collaborative field. Um, and so you might just have to attach yourself to someone mm -hmm. who's already further down that road, because I, I'm not sure it's realistic to, to be able to build that relationship or trust in the short amount of time um, with, with a bunch of other structural factors that are working against the very practices that would build those relationships, you know, a big project, a short term goal. So, you know, I think, you know, I, and I think the discipline might have to do some thinking about how we're training our next generations, um, whether, whether we're pushing them in a productive direction or whether, whether that's kind of an old fashioned model now and, and, and maybe we need to do some, some thinking about how to train them differently. Mm -hmm. But we're not, it doesn't sound like we're completely there yet in the, in the academic model. It doesn't no, sound. Like I think we're pretty far away from it. Yeah. Yeah. That's disappointing, but 
but hopefully we'll get closer. <laughs> um, Stuart, I have um, lots of people would like you to tell them a little bit, if you could, about uh, the image behind you. <laughs> lots of folk are very interested in um, understanding what that is. What can we, what can you tell us about it? Uh, I, I took this photo um, at um, Wopatki National Park or National Monument here close to Flagstaff. Um, it's an uh, area um, that's uh, only permitted to a number of visitors because of the sensitivity through the park service. So. I think there's um, uh, a lottery or a registration to 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 go there, and it it's called um, um, what is it called? Uh, anyway, it, it's um, it's it's on, in, on the Wabaki National. National okay. National. Yeah. Yeah, lots of people. They, some one person asks, "Where are you? Like, are you in Wabaki right now?" <laughs> Oh, so the background looks very, uh, very impressive. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I think that the, the place um, next to it is called uh, Crack in the Rock. Um, mm. and it's a mesa adjacent to Crack in the Rock, um, where we, um, uh, as, as, as graduate students um, at NAU, we were, um, uh, given permission to be part of the ethnographic um, uh, at that time, the assessment of the, the area. So a bunch of us graduate students from NAU uh, collaborated with the, the office, um, the cultural preservation office at the time to uh, gain skills in, in research um, and working with Hopi and, and hopefully those students are, you know, taking the initiative to, to um let other people know what they learned through that process and uh, i think it was a learning experience for them um at the time so yeah um <clears throat> we should tell people um how they can get a copy of becoming hopi um i assume those they are still available for purchase right they are. They're available from the University of Arizona Press. You can just go to their website. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and there's actually a paperback version that's going to be coming out ah. in just a couple of months. Ah. Uh, but even the hardback version, I think. We, so we, we part of the making that book accessible was was keeping the price down. So even the hardback is only seventy five dollars, which is an absolute steal for a five hundred page book that represents twenty years of. Yeah. of work um, and the paperback I think will be something in the order of 50. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think there's a, a whole bunch left of the hardback um, um, left. Mm. Or, yeah, there's okay. I think fewer than 100 copies left of that, mm -hmm. uh, but there should be plenty once the paperback comes out. Wow, wow, that's great, that's great. I was wondering if you could Give us a little bit more, I, I, a little bit more, I'd be interested in knowing a little bit more about why becoming, why the, why, 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 why you, was this something less that you just throughout your 20 years of collaborating, you, your team, your collaborators, both at Hopi and yourself just felt we need to get this information or you know where, what was the impetus to to start even that that for that report that book collaboration um i think i know there's a lot of reasons why um, we decided to um you know publish becoming hopi but from i i deal with a lot of um youth at the yeah. office, um, and that's my my. I want to get youth involved, and uh, there's been several occasions where in these youth group sessions, um, you know, out of frustration maybe, or um, yeah. that the 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 youth were asking, you know, they say, you know, that the question is, they say that um, the Hopi people were the first ones here. 
you know, our elders say we were the first ones here, but why did, you know, we choose, we, the, our ancestors chose the location that we're currently at with where there's no uh, any type of recreation like fishing or there's no forest, there's no uh, rivers through it. Why is it that the Hopi people chose this location? And I think um, we touched on a, a bit and we tried to find that answer. Uh -huh. um, and and I, I don't wanna use, mm -hmm. um, what is it? Goldilocks paradigm um, that it was just the perfect place yeah. Um, when you, for, for planting um, what we call dry farming or rain farming, where we don't irrigate, it's the perfect place where when you put seed in the ground, it, it grows, matures, and um, yields uh, food. Um, if you go further up north, you know, it gets colder. You know, if you go further and you go down south, it, you know, it's you know, kind of hot and uh, unbearable at times. So, and even if you if you go a few miles um, to the south, you know it the the land becomes barren and there's no the soil is is different. There's no uh, artesian springs. Um, you know, there's no water sources there. So it it's just the perfect place that um, uh, farming can happen and. Uh, and then I even learned something from from this book as well is that, you know, I always thought that the year 1050 was the time that um, Hopi people began building there, but it turns out that Hopi people were at this place in massive numbers population wise, um, way, way before those um, archaeological dates of 1050 or 1100s. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so I, I learned, you know, that mm -hmm. it, it was always a gathering place. And through Wes's work, you know, uh, recording sites, you, we have pit houses, we have, you know, ba basket maker type houses, and that um, evolution of uh, the archaeology phases, you know, is is evident at Hopi all the way up to, to to the modern era. So, yeah. it's highly rich in archaeology, and it's highly, it's 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 a place just waiting for for history to be told. And so, I'm really excited about this book. No, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's to me, I'm and maybe I'm slow in seeing the connection sometimes, but it's just the it's a perfect example of what we're talking about in collaboration, which is this, there are long-term collaborations going on here where re respect and, and friendship and trust were built over many, many years. And one of the products that came out of that relationship was this, this object, this book that, that meets needs all over the place, not just researchers' needs or not just Hopi. It's, you know, it's it's that listening and respecting, and we've we've gotten something better, like you were saying, better than the than than the individual parts. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's a really good lesson that and we need to listen to more. I, I just want to say, you know, Kwakwa, um, thank you to my ancestors for choosing that location because um, as, as you see, you know, through television, through social media of this infighting that's currently happening between uh, people who are supposed to, you know, help one another and be of the same, you know, um, ideas maybe, um, and you know, with cities become so massive, and and the traffic and pollution and just the chaosity surrounding Hopi, um, it's good to go back because yeah. it's it's um, it's an island away from all that. Um, for me, at least, the, the all of these things that's whirling around us, going hundred miles an hour around us, you know, and and. I know that that is kind of slowly encroaching in, but 
you know, I could you wake up early in the morning, go to the field with no one around, see the count come sun come up and uh, see the dew on the corn plants and the smell and the yeah. quiet and it it's there's no place like it. So, you know, I I like to be out there and I'm I'm hoping that that encroachment doesn't come in um, so that it's it can be a, a place of reverence for me. You know, so I'm, I'm thankful for for the ancestors for choosing the Hopi location to to call home. Well, thank you, thank you both, Stuart. As we probably should wrap up, um, it's a little after seven. Ask Bill to come back and give us a little brief wrap up, and then we'll let everyone go. Well, I think at the start, I pretty much guaranteed that there would be a. a Wonderful performance tonight. Thank you two gentlemen, uh, Stuart and, and Wes for uh, a really uh, strong presentation. This op example, this tangible example, um, carefully presented about your long-term relationship and its um, outcomes will, I think, teach a lot of people. And I really appreciate uh, everything you put into tonight's talk. Um, and we'll be back in, a, in another month. Uh, our number seven, uh, presentation is going to be on April 4th, and <clears throat> it's Kisha Supernant uh, with a, a presentation titled Archaeologies That Matter, Heart-Centered Practice, Indigenous Knowledge, and Restorative Justice in Canada. So again, this pursuing this um, theme of, of collaboration with communities on an even wider scale than just the Southwest. So Thank you, everyone. Uh, again, particular speakers tonight. And uh, we will see you folks in uh, a month on April 4th.